Mr. Nick Denton, ladies and gentlemen, the, the man who, <laughs> who founded and um, oversaw the implosion of one of the, probably the most interesting um, media companies I've, I've ever had the good fortune to write about, but I shouldn't be telling this story. You should. So it, the, what's the... Well, I mean, yours is the company that bought... Yeah, I, I should, we should mention this off, off the bat, just, just in full disclosure. <laughs> I just bought um, all of Nick's assets for $135 million. Um, so, um, or at least my company did. And we love him. I mean, otherwise we wouldn't have spent $135 million on them. They, there's a, there was a lot of value that you created at Gorka Media Group. Um, we did not buy Gorka.com. <coughs> Um, and I, I, I hear it's a that. controversial website. <laughs> so tell me, yeah, so tell me what happened. What's, what's the story? Because, I mean, I feel like everyone here kind of has the vague idea, but they want to hear it from you. <clears throat> what, the micro story or the macro story? The, 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 the macro rise and fall of Gorka. <clears throat> it, it was the independent digital media company. Uh, we never took any money uh, from investors. Uh, until really the last few months. Uh, and I, I'm a journalist. Uh, I was with the Financial Times. I was with The Economist. I, I saw an opportunity in Silicon Valley in the late 1990s and <clears throat> in New York at the beginning of uh, the 2000s uh, to make a media company without friction, without at least initially office space, without a tech platform, uh, without fixed costs. And uh, it, was a, it was an incredible opportunity to make something new, to build brands uh, in a world that really wasn't nearly as crowded as it is, as it is right now. And so that's about, it's about how it started. And the uh, fate of Gorka.com, I mean, I'm going to make a distinction between Gorka.com and the six other properties. Uh, Gizmo, you might have heard of some of them. Gizmodo, Lifehacker, Deadspin, Jezebel. Kotaku, Jalopnik, kind of vertical lifestyle properties that um, might have had their occasional controversies. But, but Gorka.com, Gorka.com was kind of the essence, it was the distilled essence of journalist. It was, it was an expression of the journalistic id. It was pretty much the most unfettered expression of that um, that I think we'd seen, I mean, you know, maybe Private Eye in the UK. Uh, is in the same kind of tradition. Some people say Spy Magazine uh, that uh, predated Gorka, and Gorka was a, a, in, in, that, in that tradition. And we lived, and Gorka.com lived, and it died as it lived, um, making controversy. And in this particular instance, um, I, mean, I, I presume everybody knows the story, <clears throat> but there was a combination of a famous celebrity that we'd written about, uh, Terry Belair, a.k.a. Hulk Hogan, and Peter Thiel, a Silicon Valley billionaire <clears throat> that we had written about years before that. And the two of them can, came together, and the rest is history. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, there was $140 million in judgments came Yeah, why couldn't, why couldn't you have paid $5 million more just to, just to, get, just to get the, <laughs> the, the proceeds and the contingent liability to the same level? Um, there was, and it was down, it, they came down against Gorka Media at the corporate level and also against you personally. Mm -hmm. um, both Gorka Media and you personally filed for bankruptcy. Um, this was presumably not the game plan. I mean, so what, what went wrong? What was, what was the mistake? I mean, <clears throat> what went wrong was uh, you had a, a story and a lawsuit that uh, it had been to federal court, we'd won in federal court, been to appeals court, we won in appeals court. Um, finally, uh, Thiel and Hogan and Charles Harder, who's the lawyer that Peter Thiel uh, funded to look for cases against a company that he was trying to hurt, um, that they got the case through to a local circuit court in Tampa, Florida which is where Hulk Hogan is from. And the jury liked him, and they didn't like a bunch of 
I think the expression was Fifth Avenue deviance um, <laughs> from New York. Um, it was a popularity contest, and we lost very conclusively. It, it is being appealed, of course, but. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, I, so was that tied up with the independence and the journalistic id? Was the idea, I mean, when you wrote your final post at Gorka.com, um, you kind of gave the impression that this, it was kind of written somehow. If it wasn't this, it would have been something else that like such a creature can only last so long. It, it was very hard to see how Gorka.com could have continued as it was, could have been itself, <clears throat> while owned by um, a corporate But was it inevitable that it would company. get wind up getting brought down by some malign billionaire? No, I mean, it could have been a pedestrian billionaire like <clears throat> uh, Frank van der Sloot, you know, who persecuted Mother Jones. Um, I don't know anything about him beyond the fact that he persecuted Mother Jones, and uh, I think actually also advertised his willingness to fund lawsuits against Mother Jones magazine. Uh, but uh, Gorka's always had an attraction to the juicy, messy, dramatic story. And so I'm not saying it's inevitable, <clears throat> but maybe it's appropriate that the site would live and ultimately be shuttered um, in a fashion as dramatic as any Gorka story. You, you shuttered sites on your own. I mean, you closed down Fleshbot because you felt that it was um, not really what you were, like, it, these people no, we, didn't we, like we, it. We, 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 I wouldn't say these people. I would say <clears throat> we, were, look, we were in New York and Metropolitan and Cosmopolitan company. Um, so m the audience was young. Um, it, it was primarily New York, LA, a few other places, pretty open-minded. You know, Jezebel writes about subjects that women's magazines would not touch because they might be squeamish. Or they, uh, the whole idea was that we were writing for a new generation that was not constrained and wasn't that prudish that sex is an important topic <clears throat> in life, in the workplace, in politics. Uh, and uh, we wrote about sex in all of its dimensions. And then we got big. And then you yeah. got big. And then and when you got big, and I mean, your, your first blog, Gizmodo, was always the biggest and was always the, the big revenue driver. Mm -hmm. And at some point, you made this pivot from what you called micro-publishing and, and trying to target small, narrow audiences into trying to go for scale and, and get hundreds of millions of readers. Um, and then when you, when you do that, when you become an actual publisher trying to make money and get scale, is that not the point at which any sensible person would look at Gorka.com and say, yeah, no, let's just close, let that one go the same way as Fleshbot? Um. Look, when? <clears throat> I, I, I don't know what the juncture would have been. Uh, and uh, I, think it, I think now it's pretty clear that general news is a, a certainly in business terms, you know, arguably it's never been a particularly great business, uh, but <clears throat> general news now, it's extremely competitive. You have not just digital players, but players from established, established media. It's always been cross-subsidized. <clears throat> it's not that attractive from an advertising standpoint. You know, maybe some general ab entertainment advertising, uh, but uh, you can and you can see it you know, in the decision by Univision to buy the six of the seven brands, you know, the category specific vertical brands like Gizmodo and Kotaku and Jalopnik, and you can see it in you know, where money is going in digital media. You know, Refinery Twenty Nine is doing uh, very nicely. Bustle is growing fast. Uh, the, <clears throat> the properties that are actually within niches, within categories, online, just as used to be true really in cable or in the magazine world, um, that often if you're in the right kind of niche, sometimes not the super, super micro niche, 
um, but something in between general news and super niche, a category like video games. You know, Kotaku has, I guess Polygon still exists, um, but, and there's IGN, there are some uh, properties from previous eras, but there aren't very many places to go to get, if you're a gamer, if you're part of that community. And I, I think we all, as, as people also, we live in a, an increasingly fragmented world in which uh, we f it's much more conju I, I find it much more pleasant to talk about a TV show I like, you know, whether it's Stranger Things or The Night Of or, you know, or some author that I love. I, it's much more pleasant to talk about that, to read that, than it is to engage in um, and to read about the latest polls in the 2016 election. So, and, and, and I think I mean, media that, reflects that. So, so tell me, as, as a, you know, erstwhile media mogul who, who was very devoted to his um, general news site and who indeed named the company after the general news site, um, I look at BuzzFeed has a general news site which is named after the name of the company. There was this company called Vox Media, which had a bunch of different properties, and eventually, when it created its general news site, decided to name it after the parent company. There's, why is it that people like you <coughs> and Jim Bankoff and Jonah Peretti insist on going into this area, which is clearly not profitable? I think mainly because of journalists like you, uh, that the surest way to attract attention you know, in fact, Gorka went beyond just general, general news. It actually wrote about journalists. It wrote about how the media covered that general news. And there, there is nothing like that to, you know, f for, for attracting attention. I, I do wonder whether things are going to change now. Uh, just the, you know, it's, very, it's pretty rare now for an entire media property to be consumed as a whole. And, and actually, it's pretty rare, even rarer for, say, somebody who read Gorka to then be made aware of Kotaku as a result of reading, reading Gorka. The content is consumed article by article. Brands, of course, matter. Um, but I think a brand needs to stand for one thing, not two things uh, these days. That you can't be, it, it's a little confusing if you're a serious news brand called BuzzFeed, supported financially by a fun entertainment combine called BuzzFeed. And that, 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 I think that creates a little bit of brand confusion. It, it's obviously been a successful formula uh, so far. Uh, but you definitely get the sense that the news is being carried by the entertainment. And as long as things are good, the news will be funded. And at the point at which things are no longer quite so good, uh, news will be one of the first places to feel the cuts. Is that true at Fox as well? Uh, I, I don't know. Is that true at Huffington Post, now that it's lost its fairy godmother? I don't know. <laughs> you, you can be a bit more expansive than that. Um, on another question, maybe. <laughs> All right, let me... Um, one, one of the uh, many celebrated editors of Gorka.com is Alex Balk, who now runs a site called The All, where he came up with something which he... Um, decided to call Bulk's Third Law, which is, quote, if you think the internet is terrible now, just wait a while. <laughs> How much worse can it get? Well, that's what, is it, well, do you agree with him? Do you think that there's, a, because what, what happened, I mean, one model of the internet is that it started by a bunch, you know, there was a bunch of, like, media companies who were vaguely, had some semblance of respectability, then you fairy mammals came along and started like shaking things up. And then in your turn, you were shaken up by Reddit and Twitter and a kind of bunch of you know, teeming commenter troll hordes who no one has any control over whatsoever. And, and then attention just kind of sinks down to the worst possible level. Is this true? Is, is that the, the horror show that you see now? I think that um, John Herman wrote a really astute comment when, when Gorka went bust, basically saying that what used to be acceptable when Gorka was founded on the publication level ceased to be acceptable at exactly the time that um, Reddit and Twitter started taking over those kind of roles. <clears throat> I mean, 
I have a personal theory, and I love Twitter, and I think it's a, you know, it's, you, you have very important conversations that take place in it. It's been liberating for a lot of people. It's forced social change and political change. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm not a Twitter basher, but I do think that the uh, trolls on Twitter and other places, obviously, but especially the trolls on Twitter, have kind of given the rest of the internet a bad name. That when the critics were bloggers, usually actually pretty smart and funny bloggers early on, they were the ones that tended to get the attention. It was cute, and it was refreshing. It was refreshing to have somebody taking apart the pomposity of the New York Times um, or the idiocy of some politician and saying what was on people's minds, what readers with maybe themselves thinking and actually being, having that kind of connection uh, with readers. But like, any time that anybody who's remotely in the public eye goes to their app mentions button on Twitter, like, they know that there's a significant likelihood that they you know, come across a frog, uh, come across some um, triple brackets I indicating um, some anti-Semitic feeling towards a particular person. It's, um, it's extremely unpleasant. And I think if, you're, if you've been in the internet long enough and deep enough, uh, I mean, I feel like I, 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 it doesn't really particularly bother me anymore, and I, I can skip over that stuff or just block it. But, uh, but I think for, you know, for me sometimes, and I think for most people in that situation, it makes it a very, very unpleasant business. And so when you're putting out an idea it's not just that it's unpleasant in itself, but when you're putting out an idea as a writer, or if you're a celebrity or a politician, you have that kind of nervousness. Like, what am I getting myself into? The writing is more defensive. The expression is more defensive. People are expecting like, that kind of toxic reaction. And I think there's a general feeling against, there's a reaction to that that has encompassed pretty much everything. That, that what would have been seen as standard journalistic criti criticism uh, can now quite easily be dubbed bullying. And it's the same damn thing that it was, um, but the attitudes have changed. And I, th I think it's, uh, it's largely to do with the surfeit of that kind of criticism. Have, have you ever been guilty of bullying? Of bullying? Um, you know, there was, a, there was a magazine called Radar. I don't know whether you remember that. <laughs> and Chance? yeah, this was kind of this was quite a long time ago, and I, I mean he doesn't. I, I, I don't think he holds us responsible, and he says at least that it got more attention. But we decided to make it a story. Um, we decided to make there was a, a an aspiring internet celebrity called Julia Allison. We decided to make her a celebrity, and when you make that kind of decision, whether you're a blog or whether you're a newspaper, whether you're the New York Post or whether you're Gorka, uh, that. That, that sometimes when you look back at it, it feels unpleasant. It feels like it could be bullying. Um, that it's just one piece after another, creating a narrative. Usually the person is complicit in it. They wanted the publicity, they wanted the attention, uh, and they, they put themselves out there. Um, but no, it doesn't make me feel good when I look back at times like that. So you, you are guilt, you, like you did bully Julia Allison. I, I think most journalists <clears throat> on a running story um, criticize people in a way that can be looked by others as bullying. This is a very gendered is issue, isn't it? I mean, the people who get the most abuse on the internet and the worst abuse on the internet are overwhelmingly women. Um, and in your company, like the people who you know, were doing the abusing, people like you and AJ who are responsible for the posts which you know, caused the end we, of the we, we have male writers, we have female writers. I, 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 don't think you can actually, I don't think you can actually sort of say that. But on a corporate level, I think, I think so where you talking, are. No, so, I've, so this is a question which I've received for you from a woman who was like, you know, is it not the case that the men basically created all of the chaos and the journalistic id and within Gorka Media, it was invariably the women who were tasked with being like the grown-ups and keeping the trains running on time and being responsible. No. <laughs> the, the original editor of Gorka.com, the inventor of Snark, uh, Snark existed before she came along, uh, was Elizabeth Spires. 
Uh, so you know, w when the Hogan trial came up and the New York Times did a piece, snark on trial, you know, that's something that Elizabeth Spires, uh, who actually wasn't a particularly mean writer, um, but she was critical. Um, that, that, that was her, her contribution. I think what is true is that women attract uh, way more than their fair share of attention. Uh, sometimes for, you know, sometimes it's positive attention, um, but, but, uh, but, but especially women who have received positive attention, it, it's almost as if that then makes them uh, vulnerable to a takedown. And uh, if you look at you know, Gamergate, which was in a way a kind of precursor, it was a, an online, what was it? It was, a, it was a flame war, really. It was an online flame war that was a precursor to some of the aggression that you see now online, the alt-right movement, you know, what you see coming out of you know, um, the channels, Reddit, etc. Et uh, that, you know, that started out <clears throat> because uh, of what the Gamergate uh, movement believed was excessive coverage by Kotaku, our video game site, of the role of women in video games. Um, they, didn't, they didn't like that, and they didn't like the fact that they saw, they saw women being kind of elevated beyond where the critics thought that they should be. And you were clearly you know, on the side of the angels when it came to Gamergate. There were the people who were wrong and the people who were right, and you were the people who were right, and you were the people who were being bullied. If you're on the progressive side of politics, yeah, most of our sites were progressive. Jezebel is a feminist site. Kotaku picked up the cause of people of color and women in video game environments. Um, so yes, if, if you're on that side of the political spectrum, you would see those sites as being on the side of the angels. I mean, is, is there a, I mean, is, is there a colorable case that, that you were on the wrong side of that? I mean, I feel like even conservatives are kind of hold their nose in Gamergate circles. Really? Maybe not. <laughs> I, I, I mean, in, case, in case you had noticed, the uh, Trump campaign CEO is um, of Breitbart News, and Breitbart News is the home of the alt-right on the internet. It's the successor to the Gamergate movement. Milo Yiannopoulos, who was the, um, another Brit. Um, how much damage have we brought? It's, it's our fault. It's, it's the white <laughs> men in general and the British white men in particular. <laughs> I apologize on, on behalf of all of us. Um, but so, 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 about, so, yeah, so, but, but, it, but it's not a, marginal, a not, not a marginal movement. And there, and there are a lot of people who believe that you know, video games should be some kind of sanctum in which people can behave as obnoxiously as they, as they want. They can be themselves uh, where they're free of the everyday rules uh, of it, real it life. It sounds behavior. like the original vision for, for Gorka, that say everything, like there's this, the, the internet is this sanctum where people can say on the internet in, in, you know, in your famous formulation what they would normally only say in the bar after work. And it was a beautiful idea, and I still think it's a beautiful idea, that, uh, and I still think we'll get there. Right now, however, you actually have so many different groups saying everything. You know, whether they're saying everything on some you know, Facebook publication that no one here has ever heard of unless all their friends are sharing that same, uh, those same stories, uh, or within Twitter bubbles, or within Gorka.com, or Breitbart, or within all of these bubbles that we have created for ourselves on the internet. And I think we're kind of making ourselves a little bit crazy. Uh, because the, the, the filter bubble theory, I think, has been, has been proven correct, that we have segregated ourselves off. Maybe that's always been true. It's probably particularly true now. It, it, part of that is wonderful. It's people of like minds coming together in a way that they never could before. Maybe they're geographically dispersed. Maybe they couldn't even recognize each other. You know, as, like, as, a, as a gay man, the fact that the internet exists and the internet made it possible to meet people that you would not be likely to meet, say, at a gay bar, um, where you could actually kind of connect with people through the internet. It's been an incredibly liberating experience, and I think it's actually also forced and pushed a lot of social change. But when people are living in the comments or in forums or on these niche sites, and when their entire news diet now 
um, maybe through Facebook, is an amplification of the opinions and shared stories from that self-selecting group, you have the risk of an online world that looks much like Somalia, a bunch of clans <clears throat> in perpetual conflict with each other, very hard to market across the full range of people, very hard to actually to come up with a pl coherent political message that actually speaks to people at the same time. And that's where I think we are now. So in terms of the, what, you know, the thing that Gorka Media stood for, which is being an independent media company, and um, obviously it is no longer independent. It has been swallowed up by Univision Communications, Inc., a multi-billion dollar television behemoth. Um, and there's one uh, narrative there, which is basically like the big companies, whether it's NBC or Verizon or Univision or whoever are going to, you know, wind up just controlling a bunch of what used to be independent. But what you're saying kind of, I think, implies a counter narrative, which is that the independent media world, for lack of a better word, is actually bigger and more vibrant than ever. It's just become completely balkanized into tiny little, you know, Facebook groups and microsites, which which are not even run for profit in the first place and therefore can't be corporatized. Uh, and the problem with the, with the really, really small sites, you know, when, when we're not talking about sites of the scale of Kotaku or Gizmodo, which are category specific or niche, but very, very large for, for niche properties. Um, but, the, but the problem when you get really small is it's just not, not economically viable to, to pay people. And so, I, I think the, like the next phase, there's been a lot of innovation in the distribution of content, uh, in making sure that the right person sees the right item at the, uh, at the, right, at the right moment. Uh, and that, I wouldn't say that problem has been solved, but Facebook, it's hard to see that you can actually kind of come up with a better personalized news experience than Facebook has created uh, on, in, in the news feed. Uh, but if you look at the, at the article level, at the kind of content creation level, there hasn't really been that much innovation at all. The process by which an article well, the, is made... The, the big innovation has been autoplay videos with subtitles. I mean, which just live in the Facebook news feed, and there is no, new, and there is no site anymore. And, and that's an innovation? Uh, yes. I mean, that's how people are now getting their news. I mean, that's how advertisers would like people to get their news, because it's easier to put adverts against that. Um, than it is against text. But you can argue that the, the, the very fact that these are autoplay auto sound off with subtitles is because actually text is quite an efficient way to consume information. Uh, and so we've kind of tried to retrofit, we've tried to squeeze an article into something uh, against which a video ad can play. Uh, and I wouldn't really describe that. It's, people do a good job. Uh, with that, you know, Business Insider has done a great job. BuzzFeed has done a, 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 great, a, a great job with those, with those kind of videos. Um, but we have yet to see whether it actually makes any money for anybody, uh, and yet to see whether actually the user experience uh, is significantly improved over, say, just reading a bit of scrolling, a scrolling text. I don't think that's a major innovation. I think the in where you've got to look for the innovation is actually in the smarter integration of user-generated content. The, you know, I think we, we took it about halfway there. We, we had <clears throat> per member of staff uh, at Gorka Media Group, and it's obviously still true for Gizmodo and Kotaku and the properties that Univision have bought. Uh, every member of staff reaches about twice as many people, audience members, as a, their competitors, partly because the writers are very good, but actually probably more significantly because they are in a discussion with readers in the comments. And so it's not just 100 paid editorial writers that you're talking about. You know, there's 10,000 people who are going to be commenting on a regular, on a regular basis who amplify the um, story, who actually make it livelier. And, and I think there's a lot more to do there with actually getting smart reader opinion, troll-free, experts, subjects, sources, actually making the whole story and content creation process just generally more collaborative 
And that, and that can be done just as easily, if not more easily, within a big company like Univision than it can. I mean, you don't need, like, the independence is much less important for that kind of thing, right? Um, I mean, I think people want to know that they're in an environment where if they've got a smart opinion, that it, they'll be heard. I, I think the, the primary challenge there is, is technical. Uh, so I think it, it, it requires more work on, uh, on interfaces and filtering out of trolls um, or selection of threads according to whether there are people worth reading actually in those threads. So that's, that's what we should be doing now that we own those sites, is like doubling down on the, the UGC? I, mean, I don't even know. I mean, UGC it's just, it's such an incredibly ugly. <laughs> it's a horrible term. <laughs> it's an ugly, ugly acronym. And it's, it's, it's ugly not just in the ugliness of the acronym, but actually in the, the principle that it represents. It's, it's not content. You know, this, is, this is understanding. These are stories. And uh, you're not just trying to create a volume or quantity of stuff. You're trying to make the writer better help the reader understand, give the reader an opportunity to ask questions, to participate themselves, to actually make the whole process of new, like of the whole consumption of news or information or reference into a, a more fun, a content party. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 some, something that, that, that when, when we look at to internet interaction, we shouldn't be automatically thinking about the toxicity of Twitter responses, um, but looking at the potential to capture, you know, if you've got a, if you've got 100,000 readers for a story, you know, the chances are that like a, like a good thousand of them are going to know at least as much as you do, mm -hmm. or more about a particular aspect of that story, and you're barely in communication with them when you when you're when you're writing. I think that's a tremendous missed opportunity. And and you did have like one of, and we now do have one of the most upbeat and constructive commenting groups in, in, on the internet, which is on Lifehacker. I mean, those commenters are amazing. And Gizmodos are excellent, too. I think there's a, there's a huge amount of potential there. And you, and you can see look, people like to chat. I mean, why, why do people love Snapchat? Like the idea that you're actually in a conversation with um, people and they're friends, or <clears throat> they're friendly, they like you. You can... You can you can tell a joke, and they're not going to jump down your throat. Uh, but it's, the, that, that is a very attractive, it's an attractive environment for people generally. And I think it can be an attractive environment for people to create content with, too. And I mean, that, that's, that was Ariana's great insight, right? When she was like, self-expression is the, is the new journalism. That you want to empower people to express themselves, and they will do everything for you. And that's what's driven Snapchat. That's what drove Twitter. and. And you also, I think, you want to be able to, you want to empower readers not to see those people if they don't, if they don't want to. So I, mean, I think the biggest problem with most of these um, collaborative environments, whether you're looking at Reddit forums or, <clears throat> or the comments on Kotaku or Lifehacker, um, I mean, the biggest problem with most of these environments is that uh, they let everybody in. That there's this assumption of some kind of democratic equality that everybody has an equal right to express themselves. And they might have an equal right to express themselves, but that doesn't mean that they should um, have an equal power to inflict themselves on, uh, on other people. You, you had astonishing power, like, at, you know, at your height, to, to inflict yourself on other people. You, you know, free, freedom of the press belongs to those who own it, and you owned a major um, network. What? But, 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 but I, th I think one of the things that was actually kind of different about it never really felt like I had personal power as, as a result. Other people certainly felt like you had personal power. <clears throat> but the thing that was distinctive of, about uh, Gorka Media Group was that there was never a list. You know, and arguably, this was our undoing as well as our making, that there was never a list of people who were not to be written about, that, that we subscribed, and the writers still subscribe to that original internet ideal um, that, hey, if it's interesting, if you, if you talk about it with somebody in a conversation, within constraints of the law, you should put it up there. Like, you should sh treat, treat writing an article. But this is, this is a bit of a straw man, right? Was there a list at The Economist? Was there a list at the FT of people you weren't allowed to write about? I, 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 when I was at the FT, absolutely. There were, there were I wouldn't say it was ever written down, uh, but there were companies that you knew 
not to go after. To take, it, it's, it's everywhere around you, if you look. Take, I don't know, TMZ has a reputation for being fearsome, taking a prisoner, uh, just controls Hollywood celebrity gossip. <clears throat> they broke the story of uh, Brad and Angelina uh, getting, getting divorced. Moment of silence. <laughs> Uh, most of their stories are about B and C list celebrities. You do not see stories in TMZ about Ari Emanuel. You do not see stories in TMZ about Steven Spielberg. The, 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 the power structure manifests itself in a whole bunch of ways, and one of the ways in which it manifests itself is that you know, basically the A list dish dirt on the B list and the C list, two journalists, um, which buys them protection. It's a currency of status. Uh, and uh, it helps to keep the interlopers down, or otherwise, you know, the, the deals that are done, where I don't know some publicist will throw some over-the-hill actor <clears throat> under the bus in order to save uh, a star who has more commercial value. You know, we'll actually trade. We'll trade stories. Uh, I'm not saying that TMZ would do this. I'm not saying that no, specific think publicist. No, I think is on the record. It's like with Nick Schmeidel, wasn't it? With that New Yorker piece about them explaining the, the behind-the-scenes machinations. But I'm not particularly interested in TMZ, to be honest. I'm much more interested in, because, I mean, maybe it's just me because I'm a financial journalist, but yeah. I'm, in, I'm interested in your history at the Financial Times. Like When people in this audience are reading the FT or the Wall Street Journal, is there... Is there some way that you read those papers, having worked in there, and, you're, and you know that there are things which they're not reading, and you can see what they're not reading? Tell, tell us the secrets. Tell us how to read this stuff. <laughs> I mean, th there are trades. <clears throat> I mean, there are explicit trades, and there are implicit trades. Uh, there's, you know, there are exclusives given in exchange, not explicit, um, but in exchange for future profiles. So I know you're an investment bank, <clears throat> they, you know, they have information about a deal. The journalist wants the information about the deal. If you're at the FT, you want it before the Wall Street Journal, or you want it at the same time as the Wall Street Journal. And the bank wants a profile of their, the, the surging investment banking unit. <clears throat> and the journalist says to the bank, um, hey, you know what, I would write about you, but you, know, you haven't been in the news that much. You know, if, you had a, if you had a deal coming up, you know, things might be a little bit different. Uh, that there'll be more reason to write about you. And so somehow, magically, newspaper gets its scoop and the investment bank gets its profile. And there are deals like that everywhere. Uh, Gawker.com, JK Trotter, <coughs> a couple of months before the site was shuttered. Actually, it was maybe a bit longer than that. It, actually did, did a story, was it Ambinder? I, I forget which of the political reporters in DC. I think it was actually several. And just the, the deals. Yes, you can have this Hillary Clinton speech a couple of hours before everybody else so you can get started on your story, but we want you to use the word muscular <laughs> to describe her foreign policy. So, and what you really need, and this is what Gorka d did, and I, and I think it's a, it's a practice that's spread more widely. You need an annotated version of everything you read and everything you watch, because behind the scenes, there are relationships, there are questions not being asked, there are, um, there are deals being done, and a large percentage of the news, it's not inaccurate, it's almost always accurate. But in the way that things are selected and in the deals that are done, it's no surprise that only one in 10 millennials trust, like fully trust the mainstream media. Because it, because it is, like it, it's a game. There are people pulling strings. Kenny Lehrer, uh, one of the most powerful people in New York media and in, in, the, in the internet media, um, he has very little public profile. But he's extremely influential behind the scenes, talking with journalists and, and, spinning, and spinning stories. And go where the power is. The corporate communications specialists uh, at the major banks and other companies have as much power as anybody but the, but the CEO. And that's a reflection of the world that we live in, which is 
a mediated world, and all of these power games are played out in the media, and you need somebody to tell you what the deals are behind the scenes, otherwise you don't really understand what's going on. And, and does that person, almost by, by its nature, does that role need to be played by an independent media company? It's a, it's a lot easier. Um, so obviously uh, it's not going to be Gorka Media anymore, so who, who's it going to be? Well, your boss, Isaac Lee, uh, at Univision has committed to the continuing independence, uh, continuing editorial independence of the uh, six properties that Univision has bought. And there are, no, there's great work being done at BuzzFeed, there's great work being done at Vox, uh, the New York Times and Washington Post are uh, more lively, pungent, opinionated, uh, they're completely explicit now about where their political allegiances lie. They really do not want Donald Trump to win, and they're, they're saying so plainly. I don't know whether that's going to make any difference, um, but we, we are in a, in a much livelier media environment, uh, even though these companies are actually, uh, these journalists are owned by some corporation. Do they have, I mean, tell me about the time series. Would, does the media have, you know, that, that group of media, the New York Times, the Journal, the blog sites, the, even, even the um, television news, does it have less power than it used to, more? How, how has the internet changed that? Well, the, I mean, this election is going to be very interesting because you've ne I don't think you've ever, ever had <clears throat> the mainstream, li let's call it liberal media, like as united, um, as mutually congratulatory of every Trump takedown, as dismissive of anybody who doesn't ask the tough questions. It's completely united, largely united. And Trump is level pegging in the polls. So what more can they do? There was, that, there was a story today about what, what Trump spending $250,000 from his charity, from his foundation, to pay business legal settlements. <clears throat> like, totally outrageous story. I read this, it was all over my Twitter feed, my Twitter feed is mainly journalists, and I was reading all these stories and they were like, yes, like, take down, got him. Really? <laughs> you, you think that's gonna get him? Like, it's not, that's not gonna make the blindest bit of difference. Nothing makes, nothing really, for the people who are gonna vote for him, they're not getting their news from those sources, they're not in my Twitter feed. Uh, they're getting their news probably from Facebook, and they're probably getting their news from, it might be from a publication, like one of the ones that John Herman wrote about, that none of us have heard of, um, but that now get more traffic. You're British, I'm British, we both woke up on the day after the Brexit vote, and like a lot of people who actually live in London, shocked, like utterly shocked, not recognizing the country they live in, because they're in London, and you know, there's still lots and lots of votes outside London, and there are lots of votes outside New York, and there are lots of votes outside LA, and uh, I don't think any of this press coverage is really gonna make much of a difference to them. So if the, if the power of the, the media has waned, there's some kind of poetic something in the fact that, you know, the guy who's, who's Trump's loudest supporter in, in Silicon Valley, Mr. Peter Deal, being the guy who, who found this new source of power, this, this you know, champity, basically, um, and this, new tech, this relatively new technique um, for turning money into power and being able to get one over on media companies. This is a strategy which can be applied against any media organization. <clears throat> well, Ch Charles Harder, uh, the lawyer that Peter Thiel found to pursue lawsuits against us, uh, is also obviously representing Roger Ailes um, in his- And his Melania case. Trump. And Melania Trump against the Daily Mail and Roger Ailes against New York Magazine and Trump is now threatening the New York Times. Um, so I, I think you know, money has always, Money has always been speech, and money has always provided a counterbalance to speech. And we buy ink by the barrel. Peter Thiel makes money by the barrel. You know, he has that endless flow of Facebook monopoly profits, you know, a monopoly that he celebrates. 
Uh, and uh, if you look at the, if you, if, if you look at this uh, big picture, never, probably since the Gilded Age, has there been such a concentration of money and power in so few hands. You know, there are 20 people who run Silicon Valley. Five, the five most valuable companies in the United States are all based in Seattle or Silicon Valley. They are all tech companies. Uh, media, if you, if you just, if you did, uh, I'm keeping meaning to do this as a map, but if you just did bubble charts, media companies, you know, uh, I guess Disney in LA, 20th Century Fox, News Corp, Time, et cetera, they're little dots. These giant bubbles on the West Coast, they, the, the five big tech monopolies, maybe to be joined by Uber and some others after that, they have more power than companies in those positions um, had before because I don't think anybody has really had the benefit of network effects to that, to that degree. And at the same time, you know, Facebook and Google are getting 85, 80, 85% of new advertising revenue uh, on, online. And the media, which, you know, the heyday of journalism depended on the classified ad revenue stream. So the media has less money, the power has more money. What do you expect? Maybe it's, we're all doomed. Um, Nick, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Oh, we, oh, you're not going to end on some more optimistic note? I, I, OK, no, you can, you can end us. <laughs> You can end this on an optimistic note. You can tell us this is, this is the, the, uh, the number one question which James Gross himself wanted me to ask you is, uh -huh. what, what is next for you? Are you going to you gonna show us something, tell us something like optimistic in, in your future? Uh, a lot of lawsuits. <laughs> 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 I, I've been trying to find, I've been trying, maybe you can help me with this. I've been trying to find a better phrase than professional litigant <laughs> to, 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 describe, to describe my upcoming year. Um, professional defendant? <laughs> but beyond well, that? Uh, I'm a writer, and this has been, I am grateful to Peter Thiel, I've got, I've got to say, uh, for, <laughs> no, I'm, I, I am actually true, I am truly grateful to him for one thing, uh, which is that he is not Frank van der Sloot. He's actually, he's actually an interesting person with some interesting ideas, some interesting ideas that some people might find despicable, um, but I find them mainly interesting. And uh, he has ideas about, he, he doesn't believe that one can be free unless one can be private within a company or as, a, as an individual. Yeah. I, in a way, I believe that you can only be free by being able to be yourself in public, that that is almost the definition of freedom. And so it makes it, it's, it's a more interesting struggle than it would be if it was just a lawsuit down in Florida about a story about a sex tape. Uh, and so I am grateful to him for making the story more interesting. And it is the ultimate Gorka story. It's got everything from sex tapes, gossip, <coughs> revelations, power, money, the eternal conflict between transparency and privacy. It's a good, it's a good story. So it's a story I would at some point like to write. And then I am interested in forums, so user-generated content, I, I, think, I think you call it. Uh, I, I, do, I do think it's possible for, I, I like a dinner party, I like a cocktail party, I like the kind of conversation that you can have when you're with people, not just people you know, um, but some people you know and some people you don't know, and there are, you, you might get into an argument, you might hear a new idea, you might reject it at the time, you might two days later find that you've somehow incorporated it uh, in that amazing, wonderful process. It's, a, it's, it's almost like some kind of genetic melding. You know, you, there's an idea, and then without even having realized it, somehow you've spliced in the DNA from that idea into your own worldview. And that's how I think societies make progress. And I think that's how the internet should feel more, like, more like a like, more like a kind of cocktail party. In the way that Twitter was, I think, for some journalists, that you'd, you'd have dinner, you'd have a glass of wine, and you go on Twitter, and there are some smart people, and at least until it got trolled to hell, it was kind of fun. 
Excellent. So, so that's what, so that's what that's I want. That's the future. To. This also, by the way, is, an, is the man who once disinvited himself from dinner at my place on the grounds that it was off the record and he would never turn up to an off the record dinner. But anyway, <laughs> Nick Denton, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that was fun. Right. You, you went back to